Hi, welcome to History Respond. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's episode, we'll be talking about Thatcher's Tech Base, a wad for Doom 2 created by 3D Doom Daddy Digital. Thatcher's Tech Base finds the player in the 10th circle of hell, otherwise known as the United Kingdom. <laughs> and they are tasked with a single mission, to find and eliminate the reanimated British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Described by the Scottish creators as, quote, a love letter to one of humanity's greatest threats, Thatcher's tech base finds digital games in a place they often try to avoid, political satire. While Thatcher has been pilloried in films, comics, and television shows like Spitting Image, she's never before been turned into a mechanical cybernetic demon that you can kill over and over again. To help me consider this depiction of Margaret Thatcher and compare it with other satires about the Prime Minister, I've invited onto this episode Dr. Martin Farr. Dr. Farr is a senior lecturer in contemporary British history at Newcastle University. His research focuses on British politics and public life since the First World War, and he's currently working on a book called Margaret Thatcher's World, which will consider the international history of Thatcherism. Martin, welcome to History Respond. Hello, Bob. Thank you. So, Martin, we are starting a new game here uh, in Thatcher's tech base. And uh, you told me before we started recording, you're not too familiar with Doom or video games. Is that correct? Put it mildly. <laughs> um, so here we've got the opening sequence. And uh, the images you can see here, these are taken directly from Doom 2. This is kind of standard for a Doom 2 modification. Uh, but they've got some added in elements here uh, related to uh, Margaret Thatcher. We've got uh, Big Ben off the background. And then once we enter this next room, down this elevator, we'll get a sense of the direction that this game is going in with some of its, uh, some of its Margaret Thatcher focused imagery. And just as kind of a starting question, particularly since most of our audience is based in the United States, I'm wondering, could you give us a brief background on Margaret Thatcher herself? Uh, the person uh, is significant because she was the first uh, woman prime minister, uh, and she was an MP since the 1950s, when there were very few female MPs. Uh, she was a person without a particularly distinctive political profile, until she became leader of her party in 1975. Uh, and she did so largely because the present leader had lost two general elections and she presented herself as being an alternative, not merely as a person, but as a style of leader. And she saw it um, answering the question that was being posed in Britain in the mid-1970s, which was essentially about the governability of the state and the post-war settlement. Excellent. Yeah, and so we can see here we've got some of these images, and they're a little bit uh, pixelated uh, because this is a, a Doom 2. This is a game that's <laughs> almost 30 years old. Um, but we can see some of these uh, images uh, related to Thatcher's uh, uh, prime ministership, and then also we've got the center top image, I think, from uh, Spitting Image, uh, the puppet. Uh, so... Uh, we'll jump through to this beginning section. And I should warn you, Martin, that because this is Doom, there's a great deal of blood and violence. Um, the, the the focus in this game, uh, I think, is the political satire and less on the uh, the actual kind of look of uh, uh, the violence here. And this is a little weird section here. They've got this uh, drop-down moment. So we'll jump down here. Hopefully you're not queasy. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have the credits, and so this actually begins the game. And so we'll walk through here, fighting as we go. And this will actually, the end of the credits here, this will bring us up to the start of the game, once we walk all the way down here. And this game is dedicated to everyone that Thatcher hated and everyone who hated Thatcher. So, I th it, it wears its politics on its sleeve, as we might say. Mm. 
so here we've got the beginning of the game, the dead speak. <laughs> One of humanity's greatest threats. No choice but to head to the tenth circle of hell. So this is a uh, a doom wad, and you know because this game is nearly thirty years old, it's not very common to have uh, a doom wad gain a lot of publicity. Right? It's an old game, not many people are still creating modifications for it. But this is a, a particular Doom one that gained a lot of attention with the video game audience uh, over the last few weeks uh, since it was released in late September. And a lot of that has to do with kind of the, the popularity, the remaining popularity of uh, Margaret Thatcher as a polygonal figure. And so I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective as an expert on Thatcher and Thatcherism, what has made Margaret Thatcher such an enduring figure uh, for both celebration and for hate? Well, um, first thing is you mentioned that the creators of this were Scottish, and that's uh, fairly consistent with her reputation in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And the um, fact, I mean, she should actually be an icon for Scottish nationalism because it's made the appeal of independence much greater than it was before she was prime minister. I think to a large US audience, it's quite useful to um, compare and contrast the UK and the US uh, at the time she became prime minister with the time when Ronald Reagan became president because the reagan Thatcher partnership is a very close one. Uh, and I've spoken uh, many times in the US on reagan Thatcher, and indeed on Thatcher. And Thatcher is a, a widely revered uh, public figure in the US, more so than she is here, or at least to say that there's a greater division here. There were people who hate her, um, and indeed there were death parties after she died in 2013 in various places in the country, including where I am now, Newcastle, in the north of England. The essential element of the Thatcher narrative, which is why she endures, is that, um, and this applies also to Reagan, is that both the US and the UK in the 1970s were at a very low point in their post-war history with inflation, with unemployment with national humiliation in the US case with the Iranian hostages, in the UK with the IMF loan uh, two years earlier. Um, the Callaghan in Britain and the Carter administrations in the US were seen as having taken the US and the UK from the victorious position after the war to being in the depths of ungovernability. And part of the narrative at the time, and this is a largely accepted one in Britain, even by those who aren't sympathetic to her, is that Thatcher and Reagan arrested this decline and reasserted the national profiles of their countries. Um, in both cases, they did so. They're, they're, not, they're not exactly the same at all, or even closely similar in many respects. Um, the, the UK being a much more socially democratic, much more corporatist uh, state than the US. But nevertheless, Reagan's attack on trades unions, Reagan's desire to introduce supply side economics, what patched it in the UK. Uh, she saw trades unions as being too powerful. She saw too many industries as being nationalized, being uncompetitive. She saw the growth of welfare since the war as having created welfare dependency. So she's, she's waging a cultural war uh, as well as an economic war on what she sees as collectivism, socialism, as essentially undermining the imperatives of individuals and their motivations. Um, a landmark legislation, a piece of legislation that she introduced in 1980 was the Housing Act. Essentially, this allowed people who owned, who, who rented their housing from the state to buy the property themselves. And overnight, they became property owners. Overnight, they became more likely to be Conservative Party voters. Overnight, they felt less of a connection with the state. And it did more in a single piece of legislation than anything else to affect profound social change, social mobility. <clears throat> and to round off this rather lengthy answer, uh, in many respects, where we find ourselves with Trump and with Brexit is what we saw with the changes that Thatcher um, introduced or accelerated, which is uh, a large working class communities which are increasingly likely to vote Conservative and highly educated urban voters who are increasingly likely to vote Labour. It, it, it's almost upturned, upended the voting patterns uh, of Britain in most of the 20th century. So the effect is profound mm -hmm. uh, and that's why uh, she is the most consequential politician in Britain since uh, Churchill. Nice. 
And so uh, it's a very useful answer. I think that helps to set the stage a bit for a lot of this uh, propaganda, uh, <laughs> negative Thatcher propaganda that we see here. Uh, we've got references to uh, the Iron Lady rusting in peace, uh, being a liar, uh, kind of defacement of her, uh, I would suppose, uh, her own political propaganda here with the devil horns uh, added in, Rotten Hell, Maggie Thatcher. And um, then over here, I think around this corner, uh, something a bit more controversial around this corner here uh, is we only have to be lucky once, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, but that's a reference to the IRA's attempts on Margaret Thatcher's life. Yes, this was a statement the IRA issued after the bombing of the hotel in Brighton on the south coast of England, where the Conservative Party held its annual conference in 1984, and a bomb was planted in the bath of a room below the suite that Thatcher was to stay in, and it killed several people, including an MP. Uh, didn't kill Thatcher because typically she was working late uh, in the study. Had she been in bed, she would have probably been killed. So she survived. Um, the effect of the bomb was uh, to, well, it shocked politics and it, and it killed people and it, it ruined people's lives, but it didn't do its objective in killing Thatcher, and that, um, elicited the response you just read that um, they have to be lucky once and security across the board was massively increased mm -hmm. uh, although as we know in the UK last week a lawmaker was murdered yes. uh, in his constituency by a terrorist so political violence didn't end in 84. Yes and you know given the Thatcher stature in the UK and then also the United States. I'm wondering, you know, we made reference at the top to the uh, developers being from Scotland. Is there a great deal of variation in the UK itself with the opinion of Thatcher? I tell my students half jokingly, only half jokingly, that I can predict what their attitude will be towards Thatcher and Thatcherism by their accent. Mm. And those with a northern accent are almost always likely to be highly critical of Thatcher. And those with a southern accent, particularly those from London in the southeast, are more likely to be supportive because they're channeling their parents' experience. Mm. And the experience of their parents or grandparents in Scotland or the north of England or in South Wales would have been one of deindustrialization of industries being closed down, as she would see it, for greater gold, greater purposes but also meaning that communities lost their means of um, support. I mean, very similar things happened in the Rust Belt in the US. Um, but this was an accelerated change by the government, partly um, with a political purpose because it weakened the Labour Party and the, the, the landmark event was the miners' strike mm -hmm. in 1984-85 when Thatcher faced down coal miners who had brought down the last Conservative government in 1974 and she was determined that that wouldn't happen again and so she faced them down and broke them. And effectively at that moment broke trade unionism in Britain as a means of um, representing workers. Uh, in the South, by contrast, uh, there was a house price boom. There were privatizations of industries, which meant the share ownership was expanded. Um, the financial, I mean, it, it predated Thatcher. The North-South divide in Britain predated Thatcher. There has always been um, privileging of London in the Southeast and financial capital over the North and Scotland in industrial um, labor. And particularly since Britain has shifted from being an industrial to post-industrial, economy since the war. So these things were accentuated, exaggerated, and the North-South divide was quite a profound one. But it's been muddied in the last 10 years by the cultural politics that helped produce Brexit. Um, mm -hmm. But in Thatcher's period, certainly, the, the North-South divide is still something which is felt. And the view of her, I think, can still be seen in the grandchildren of those who were around at the time. And given that generational divide, um, do you find that uh, maybe there's some more, I don't know how to put it, but uh, historical inaccuracies that have crept in uh, because of that political divide, because of that generational difference? Because, you know, I take, for instance, the developers of this game, I think they're in their late 20s. And so they would have missed, um, you know, Margaret Thatcher, they would have missed her regime. And yet here we have uh, a... A game which is you know taking obvious shots at margaret thatcher and her legacy so i'm just wondering do you see that yourself do you see that as uh, being an issue this kind of generational difference uh in current views of thatcher and well, thatcherism it, it, it's certainly the case and i don't know the extent to which the makers of this game were, were doing this tongue-in-cheek or whether this is meant to be serious um commentary on her 
Um, but it deals in stereotypes and caricatures, of course. So many of these stereotypes and caricatures were evident after she died and in the competing interpretations of her legacy um, and the extent to which people um, deprecated her or lauded her. Uh, and there were those who were devoted, and there were those who, who held passes that she died. Um, as an academic, as a historian, of course, most of the most of the public perceptions of things that have happened are usually erroneous in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, necessarily, inevitably so. I'm not criticising for that. And, it, and they're shaped by dramas, by TV programmes, by movies. Uh, the Iron Lady is now probably more important in terms of that, the movie with Meryl Streep probably more important in terms of international reception of Thatcher than anything else, because that's mm. what most people have seen, if, the, if they know of her. So yes, it's full of mistakes. And one thing I've discovered when I've been doing this book, Margaret Thatcher's World, which is about the international receptions to Thatcherism, is just how inaccurate reporting of things in Britain is in the foreign press. And I'm sure this isn't unique to Britain. I'm sure this is the... If you were to read British reporting of US news, it would, you'd also be able to find fault in it. But the, the, the biggest central mistake that's made certainly abroad, is the idea that because she won three elections, that she was a popular and unifying figure. Um, but in fact, we have this electoral system in Britain, which means you can win power very securely with a minority of votes. She never actually had more than 42% of the vote in any election. But the system delivered her very large majorities, which allowed her to implement profound change. So superficially, it looks like this was a highly successful, unifying person, whereas in fact, it was very far from the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and she based indeed based her appeal on not being widely loved. Her view was, I'm not, not loved, but I'm respected. And she placed a premium on being seen as being a competent leader rather than being somebody who was a consensualist. Indeed, she felt consensus politics had been the fault in Britain and that the Conservatives had been dragged too far to the left and too far to this socialist way of managing the economy or trying to ensure full employment. Her concern was the market and the market as the determinant of prices and the market as a way of empowering individuals. Um, you can see here I am uh, in the midst of uh, typing in cheat codes, Martin. Um, this is not something I, I would normally recommend, but uh, in order to give us the opportunity to kind of fully explore this level, which is really big, uh, I am going to go ahead and turn in uh, the most important of these cheat codes which uh, being a 30 year old game you actually have to type in yourself uh, using a keyboard I'm gonna turn on uh, no clipping mode uh, which allows us to travel through any part uh, of the map uh, without any restrictions and while I'm walking into the next section uh, of this game I wanted to point out this weapon so I I just turned in a cheat code that it gives us the opportunity to uh, have all the weapons that are available in this game. So this includes uh, a number of uh, weapons that are familiar to Doom 2 players. Uh, double barrel shotgun, uh, the chain gun, uh, let's see what else here. We've got uh, uh, the pulse rifle, uh, and then the, uh, the BFG is a huge mega weapon. But the one I wanted to point out here was the rocket launcher, which has been uh, changed ever so slightly uh, to make the projectiles look like Trident missiles. Mm. Uh, and so this is, a, I think, a pointed attempt on the developer's part to uh, speak on Margaret Thatcher's roles with the development of uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the mm. UK and with the Trident missile program in particular. Yes. Um, and again, that's very interesting because the British nuclear deterrent is based in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, Royal Navy submarine base in Fas Lane, and that's been a key issue for the SNP, which is committed to a non-nuclear policy. And the, the big connection with the US, of course, is that the US creates the, uh, creates the missiles, so we use American missiles with British warheads, um, which is an example of the special relationship as it exists in defense, mm-hmm. security, and intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I guess we could say that this... Uh this game has a very uh, Scottish perspective <laughs> on Margaret Thatcher, mm. and I'm I'm wondering, you know, given the changes that have gone on with the relationship between Scotland um, and the UK, particularly since the um, independence referendum, um, where do you see that kind of history of Margaret Thatcher? Where do you see that playing a role in that relationship? Is is Margaret Thatcher still very important? The Thatcherism is still very important to that kind of relationship? Or do you think that the kind of English-Scottish relationship is kind of more based on other things by this point? 
It's only an aspect, but it was something which accentuated difference in the 1980s. Um, and it saw the collapse of the Conservative Party in Scotland because it could be presented by Labour as well as by the SNP, the Scottish National Party, that Scots had not voted for the Conservative Party, but they had a Conservative government, mm -hmm. which actually also applied to where I am in the north of England. But the yes. difference is that Scotland has a national um, identity which could claim that this is a, a government which we don't support. Um, and so she doesn't appear very often as an icon, but she helps set the tone and establish the sense of difference and establish the notion of there being um, a government far away. What's been transformed since then, of course, is devolution. Yes. So Scotland is now one of the most um, uh, powerful sub-national legislatures in the world and has power over most things except defence, security and the economy. So devolution means that it is, it is in very many ways increasingly independent of um, the UK. But um, to complicate matters further, we've had Brexit. Yes. Uh, and Brexit has the effect of both making independence for Scotland or Scots much more appealing because they could rejoin the European Union and they could think of themselves as Euro a European nation rather than a British one. But at the same time, as we've seen with Ireland and the Northern Ireland border, it will make it much harder. So actually the economic arguments for against independence will be much stronger in 2023 or 24 than they were in 2014. Mm. Do you think that was an intention? of uh, this kind of policy of Brexit, or do you think that was just a no, consequence? That suggests much. That suggests much more forethought in the policy <laughs> of Brexit than the actual case of I see. So here we have our first look at the uh, cybernetic demon Margaret Thatcher. Uh, we can see here, here located in uh, a what you might call a version of Parliament, I suppose. It looks mm. a little, House Commons. Little, little awkward, but uh, House of Commons here. Uh, and then I guess uh, Margaret Thatcher here on top of the uh, speaker's chair. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is kind of the main attraction in this game is being able to fight various uh, versions of Margaret Thatcher who is, uh, her image is placed on uh, characters or enemies from uh, the original version of Doom 2. Uh, so this is... Uh, attempting to make use of art assets from a 30-year-old game, but uh, still I think it's uh, pretty clear based on the hair uh, and based on some of the imagery of who you are uh, fighting against here. And um, I did want to ask another question. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but you can see some of these objects here. Uh, on top of this uh, dais um, and a couple of the uh, things you can see is they've got these milk cartons oh, yes. uh, which are for health that. and then there's no, also yeah. and then there's also minor helmets uh, yeah. which are used to give you uh, armor so I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about the imagery there sure the milk is a very important Thatcher trope uh, she was the Secretary of State for Education uh, in the 1970s in the Heath government. And one of her policies was to um, stop cow's milk being issued to school children, which was a policy brought in after the war by the Labour government because children were needed the extra nourishment and protein um, and rickets was quite common. So milk was provided for children and Thatcher ended milk in schools. She felt it was um, not justifiable on economic grounds and that the country was much more healthy than it had been in 1945. But it meant that the term Maggie Thatcher milk snatcher could be used. <laughs> and the, 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 the depiction of her as a milk snatcher as being a, a cruel person uh, and also as a, as a woman sort of contravening or subverting the notion of her as a maternal figure um, feeding children with milk um, fed very much into this notion of her as being an uncaring, unthinking person. Uh, the minor helmets, of course, relating to the 84, 85 minor strike. Um, and one of the funny things about this is, I was discussing with a student of mine yesterday, whose grandfather had been a miner and he lost his job, was that miners hated working in mines. It was very dirty, very unsafe. Um, but the problem was the closing down of the mines and not replacing the work with anything else. And so the, the, the purpose, the heart of communities was, was, was torn out mm. and never replaced. And that's, I'm afraid, still evident. And these are the places which, by and large, voted for Brexit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so here we've got some more uh, images here, unflattering images, demonic images of Margaret Thatcher. And then, of course, this last one here from uh, Spitting Image. And so I was wondering, kind of thinking about this, 
game as a satire, well, how does this mm. compare to previous versions of satire related to Margaret Thatcher, particularly Spitting Image? Well, there's more blood. <laughs> um, you don't say. Uh, <laughs> yes, I've not quite seen anything like this before in my life. Um, <laughs> the Spitting Image was, I mean, in the US you had DC Follies, which is a much softer version of um, satirizing politicians in uh, latex. But Thatcher was the, was the dominant figure in Spitting Image, which was an, uh, an ITV satire from the early to the late 80s. Often very funny, uh, brilliant, brilliantly um, realistic um, puppet models. Um, in it, her, her persona changed across the course of um, the series. She often appeared early on in, in Churchillian dress uh, and a hat and a cigar, channeling the Churchill cult. Uh, towards the end, she appeared increasingly demented and often vampiric. And the most famous sketch and the wittiest sketch features her in a restaurant with her cabinet ministers and the waitress asks her what she will have for her dinner and she says steak and the waitress says how would you like it and Thatcher replies raw please and then she gestures to the cabinet and says to her and what about the vegetables and Thatcher replies oh they'll have the same as me uh, and this notion of Thatcher as being by far the dominant personality in her government and also the most masculine character despite being the only woman is a very strong thread in spitting images depiction of her. Mm. Okay, well let's uh, let's continue going forward here, and I'm gonna jump us forward, uh, uh, kind of cheating a little bit, obviously, uh, using the no clip feature, and I'm gonna walk through this. Let me just mention that statue you just saw, Bob. Yes. There was a, two white statues. They were unveiled in a gallery in London, and within a week had been decapitated. Um, by someone with an axe, oh. um, and then it had to be re restored behind glass. That statue there. So um, you know, even even a statue of her is in danger of being attacked um, in the 2020s. Hmm. Oh, there are. I don't think there's an opportunity to destroy these statues, but there are several moments in this game where uh, you have the opportunity to proceed through a door, proceed through a level, um, but in order to do so, you have to destroy. Um, uh, a Union Jack, a flag, and burn it. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's uh, it sends a pretty strong, strong <laughs> message. <laughs> so let Particularly me... as uh, I mean, she was a very strong nationalist. Yes, and made much of the flag, and in the Falklands campaign and with the European Union, was very keen to present a, a very sort of almost a chauvinistic, jingoistic sense of what Britain and Britishness meant. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I would suppose the. The Falkland Lores, I mean, that's usually pointed to as a moment where kind of British nationalism is renewed in the wake of empire, yes. in the wake of uh, kind of troublesome 1970s. That's right. Um, and that also helped rescue her first administration because it suggested a person who was decisive um, and could got, get, got things done. Although it was, of course, a war that was only really won with um, tacit U.S. support, mm -hmm. well, not publicly, but privately. So uh, here we've got this moment, and uh, the assumption is by this point, if you haven't cheated like I have, that you've uh, killed cybernetic Margaret Thatcher. And so in order to celebrate that, we have this uh, very famous uh, lines here from, I believe it's a 1981 uh, Norway-England uh, game of uh, soccer. Mm. Uh, football in the UK, uh, where uh, we have the Norwegian commentator uh, uh, telling Margaret Thatcher that uh, her boys have taken a hell of a beating. He shouted it. He got very excited. <laughs> uh, I know you're a football fan, Mart uh, Martin. I don't know if uh, you know if that uh, bothers you at all, or if uh, if you're no, feeling no, a little bit better about the, the English team now. I thought it was 91. Um, no, no, it, she had no interest at all in football, as it happens. And one of the things she tried to do, because at the time, football hooliganism was very common in Britain, quite racist uh, violence outside football grounds, was she tried to introduce a national membership scheme for football, which, which showed an absolute tin ear for, for the game and its, and its meaning. But her view was, was completely unsympathetic and wanted to basically, not militarise, but to regulate the sport to stamp out this, um, this vice, which is which has now gone through other more subtle means. But she was certainly out of character. And also, of course, it meant that she was out of touch with those parts of the country, often northern and urban, where football developed historically. Mm -hmm. And 
I should mention that the uh, developers, because this is using copyrighted material uh, that was published in the mid-1990s, they are not really allowed to sell this game. Uh, it's a free download. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they do recommend is if you enjoy uh, Margaret Thatcher's tech base, uh, that you give a donation, uh, and they have some recommended um, uh, charities uh, on their website that you can donate to. Uh, and two of them that I wanted to point out, uh, the first uh, being the uh, Hillsboro Justice Campaign, uh, and then also the Coal Industries Social Welfare Organization, uh, which I think uh, speaks to a couple of the points, uh, particularly Hillsboro, uh, that you just mentioned there is in terms of the kind of uh, geographical dis or differences in uh, opinions on Margaret Thatcher. Yes. And Hillsborough, of course, was uh, Liverpool supporters were killed in that match. And Liverpool is, is perhaps the, the, the place in the whole of the United Kingdom where Thatcher is most despised even today. Um, and where the Labour vote is, is weighed more than counted. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have here, this is the end of the game, uh, the uh, uh, kind of assumption here by this point is that you've destroyed the cybernetic versions of Margaret Thatcher, so here you're in the inner halls of hell, and you have uh, Thatcher's soul, uh, which you can eliminate. But um, in these dark areas, which I've opened up using a cheat code, uh, we've got uh, all of these uh, kind of pieces of propaganda, uh, all of these images that were used throughout the course of the game. So it kind of gives you a moment to, uh, to take in all of the uh, work that had been done for this game, as well as the credits here. And so if you missed any of the uh, previous versions of these images in the rest of the game, then you can come here and uh, take a look at them, as long as you don't mind fighting this kind of leftover <laughs> cybernetic demon, which I'll do my best to get rid of here. <clears throat> so I guess while I'm in the midst of fighting for my life, Martin, um, could you give me a sense, and you've touched on this already, but could you give me a sense of how Thatcher's history, how her legacy has been used with regards to Britain's relationship with the European Union in the last decade? It's more complicated than people, I think, imagine. There were, there were lots of invocations. No one quite took out a Ouija board, but there were lots of questions <laughs> asked as to how she would have voted in 2016 on Brexit. Um, no one knows, of course, um, and people can only speculate. Certainly her view had hardened against the European Union or the EEC as it was then, the European Economic Community. Uh, she was a very su great supporter in 73 when we went in. She was a very great supporter of staying in in 75 in the first referendum. She saw the European project essentially as a market, as an opportunity for trade. What transformed things was that over the course of the 1980s, a French socialist, and you can't really imagine anything worse for Margaret Thatcher than someone who's both French and socialist, <laughs> called uh, Jacques Delors, um, helped introduce a social dimension to the market, and that involves social welfare, work, rights for workers, uh, regulations. Uh, and she spoke infamously at a speech in Bruges in Belgium in 1988 to say that she had not worked to uh, roll back the frontiers of the state in Britain to see them restored from a foreign power. And this hardened at the same time as the European Union in bringing into practice an, an entirely Thatcherite policy, the single market, um, which is causing so many problems in Ireland. The single market was a Thatcher idea, uh, and it was a way to facilitate trade and facilitate the movement of goods and services. But it came alongside the growth of the EU as a distinctive political identity, so mm -hmm. an anthem, a constitution, a flag, the notion of the EU being the dominant um, political profile and other governments being supplement to it um, and she reacted against that and it, it, curiously it was because she was deemed to be too Eurosceptic that her party one of the main reasons the party got rid of her in 1990 that party now of course is entirely Eurosceptic in Parliament and mm -hmm. many of them inspired by Thatcher's increasingly hard tone so while it's impossible to say how she would have voted certainly the party that voted to leave was the party very much that she had inspired um, and the, the, the incompatibility of a single market in the EU with her um, vaunted nationalism is one reason we end up with this very messy Brexit uh, 14 years after, 24 years after her government ended. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think that does it for this episode. Martin, any any kind of lasting thoughts? Any other topics that you wanted to broach? Or are you well, are you I'm, happy I'm to leave to leave the tenth circle of hell? <laughs> I'm I'm slightly shaken by how much violence I've seen in the last thirty minutes, Bob. I had no idea um, it would be like this. Um, but it's been interesting seeing how much. I mean, there's. I mean, some of the some of the criticism is absurd, and the, the notion of evil, I think, is, is not is not helpful. Um, but the, I don't think these things are designed to be moderate, are they? I mean, in, in moderation is part of the appeal of this sort of game, as far as I can tell. Yes. But what we can see now is lots of, I mean, genuine examples of of, of what we would call primary sources of of um, political communications, posters, and things that existed at the time. So these are accurate. Um, but the problem with this is, is and this is probably the, 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 my, my own reaction from seeing this, uh, there's obvious hatred in the game, there's obvious hostility from the creators, and there is indeed in the country. Um, but nevertheless, she, she won three elections convincingly, um, and the Conservatives won the election after she left office. So it, it is something that people who um, greatly despise her, I think, need to give more credence to or engage more seriously with, rather than merely denounce um, because it is more multifaceted and more complex than simple denunciation would would suggest. Mm. Well, Martin, thank you very much for your time. My great pleasure, Bob. Thank you. And uh, viewers, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you enjoy our work, uh, please visit our website, historyrespawn.com. Uh, and if you really enjoy our work, uh, please consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history respond. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>